This poem's called Embossed. Arrington de, Di de this is <laughs> Arrington de Dionysio is the frontman from the band Old Time Religion. He's on stage looking haunted, as if he wants to infect us all with his haunt, like an extra from the 45 pound cult hit zombie horror film Colin. He's here promoting his new album, a mouthful of a solo project, Arrington de Dionysio's Malaikat Dancinga. Drumming, he's roped in Owen Curtis Williams. Sometimes it feels as if it's impossible to see a band in Edinburgh without seeing Owen unzip his grey hoodie and crack his knuckles, getting ready to play drums. He plays with Jesus H. Fox, The Pineapple Chunks, Rob St. John, Ran Ban Discotheque, Benny Hem Hem, and that's what the old man said and he never came back. He's previously played with Emily Scott, Wood Pigeon, Our Ladies of Sorrow, Sheer Khan, Eagle Owl, Tiso Lake, and Prose. Then there are these one-off flirtations with visiting bands. I'm panging horrendously, coveting that floaty, amorphous, polygamous creative life dreaming of enslaving myself all the time to the whims and attitudes of other artists. But through that, well, I don't really know how it works. Owen's his own artist too, a better one, because of the must-be exhilarating influence of all these other bands with all their different ideas and styles. Anyway, the truth is, Owen's so in demand because he's a really great drummer, his tongue lolling out, his head flung back, as if his brain had slipped down his chest, and that's what's instructing the battering of the sticks in his fists onto the kit. When I first arrived tonight, he was smoking a cigarette outside, and I did that sort of awkward nod. He's wearing a black t-shirt with a cute, angry, embossed picture of a grizzly bear that I'm sure I've seen him wear before. This poem's untitled, uh, but it kind of looks like that, and the idea is that you can read them in any order, but I think I'll just read them in sort of what ones are. Um, the sky a shiny purple color, like the skin of a plastic aubergine, or what car spray paint manufacturers call purple velvet, stand out and go faster, a custom color, a DIY, the smashed up, ironed off varnish from plum nails about an hour later. Slow coming dark, slow coming darker, by street lamps, and kind of of them. From an arsenal of pillows, your unrealistically black hair, flopping, soggy, frayed and burst, a worn flotation device, and slapped, a little piece broke, maybe broken off or never there, I filmed the performance, and it was kind of a chewy vid, the camera budging back and forth, and everyone gooing around, and anorak noise, and rucksack noise. But Nancy's photos did a much better job. You can actually see each letter as it falls over the balustrade, but in mine it looks like a denim wedding, I guess. The phone needs to accept an orange SIM card, but maybe can be hacked, which will mean invalidating your warranty. Young adult fiction sales down 37.5%, literary in general 2.7%, sci-fi 12.6%, and crime thrillers and adventure 10.1%. We legislated to reduce the amount of sugar and salt in processed foods, but nothing really changed. Or if it did, it changed for the worse, and that was trending already, some said, disconnected. This is a poem called <coughs> Poetry is Love in Action. I was at a poetics conference and I heard Michael Golston say in a paper on Clark Coolidge, Poetry is Love in Action. I jotted it down. I desperately want that formula to be true, like bubble baths make you sleep well. I haven't slept well in the bath since we first got together because it <laughs> frightens you to think I might slip under and not wake up. You forget I'm a little large to drown in our bath. I barely fit in, so could I drown? <laughs> but what kind of love in action is poetry? 
When I was a teenager, I was hopelessly in love with some guy. This happened rather often, with more than one guy, so I don't have one in particular in mind. And I invariably associated a song with him. Sometimes a song I'd heard him hum, uh, sometimes, or sometimes a song that just happened to play when we were both in a corridor. I'd lie in my bedroom and play the cassette tape over and over and over. Play, rewind, play, rewind, play, rewind. I would do this for hours. And I have to admit that although in the first instance I was filled with desire for the guy, gradually this shifted to being desire to hear the song. Until at some point it would dawn on me that my desire was strongest for the gap in between, when with my finger on the button I would hear the very familiar buzz. I loved that faint whir and my anticipation of the, ins the assertive click, click. Desire, through a conviction that it wouldn't ever be fulfilled, focused on the act of rewinding, a repetitive act, passive, lonely. And because I would lie there for hours, I sure-footedly can say I was in the throes of a kind of erotically charged boredom. It's not difficult to speculate why I so fixated on this act. I was obscenely obsessed with my own self-pity always going back to the start and playing it through again. Schopenhauer said that boredom is just the reversal of fascination, that both depend on being on the outside of something rather than the inside, and that one leads to the other. I certainly felt on the outside as I rewound pop songs on cassette tapes, my intense boredom and equally strong fascination continually outstripped each other like long-distance runners. When one dropped back, the other steamed on, or like dough needed full of air and knocked back to deflation and then re-needed and so on. I wasn't doing this through a conviction that I'd find backtracked satanic messages that had been leading me and others so frighteningly astray, a la the band Cradle of Filth. Or scratch that, maybe I was. Up in my room, rewinding tapes, I think I must have been looking for messages. My desire so used to pointing outwards fruitlessly towards guys at school that I would be willing to find some kind of response anywhere, be it spooky as you like. I'm not sure whether it comes across for anyone else, but when typing this out, I sometimes felt as though I was back, listening compulsively to that buzz again, caught up in conflicting senses of possibility and boring inevitability. And I'll just read a couple more uh, shorter ones. Um, this poem's called My Father Dresses Like Roland Bart. <laughs> My father dresses like Roland Bart used to, with great style, I mean. But this morning, he has light beige linen trousers on, loose-fitting and well-ironed. He has matched them with a pale purple shirt. He isn't eating breakfast, only drinking coffee and juice. This is because he will go for a swim at 8.15 like he does every day. My lashes tick as my eyes vibrate towards the clock on the only used for melting chocolate microwave. 7.59. I'm still shuffling back and forth in my seat, brushing my sandals against the floorboards, but we've turned off the music and are listening to the news. Uh, and maybe just one more. Uh, so th this poem is called A Man Tied Up in His Own Composition, and it's um, based on a painting by an artist called Adrian Vizhnevsky, who I really love. He's a Glasgow-based artist. Um, so, yeah. <coughs> Buttered noodles patchwork a yellow tie, and I can't think straight, spilling yellowy yogurt, wearing red corduroy. Remember being called loopy? And remember being called colorful and crouch? It makes no difference, none of the loops are knotted. No difference, none of me bound fast in the weeds on the pavement on Dalkeith Road. This yellow cube would look all right, and I might, if I get lucky, get feebly entangled. Wish I was thin enough to strap around your wrist what time is when you write about people, you can rub them out and leave a ghost. And when you work over, it can become rich in color, blue possibly. Anyway, I can't resist putting in a face. I put in a layer of skin, an eye or two, blue possibly. Mm -hmm.